This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, War, Peace, and the Presidency. We are breaking with convention. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez as we wrap up our five days here in Chicago covering the DNC. As we continue our coverage of the Democratic National Convention, we turn now to look at the legacy of Shirley Chisholm. In 1968, she became the first black woman elected to Congress. Four years later, in 1972, she became the first woman and the first African-American to seek a major party nomination. On Thursday night, the Reverend Al Sharpton spoke at the convention and talked briefly about her. 52 years ago, I was one of the youth directors in her campaign for president. And 52 years after she was told to sit down, I know she's watching us tonight as a black woman stands up to accept the nomination for president of the United States. Yeah. Um. That was the Reverend Al Sharpton speaking at the Democratic National Convention uh, this week. Shirley Chisholm now speaking in 1972 when she declared her presidential candidacy. I stand before you today as a candidate for the Democratic nomination for the presidency of the United States of America. I am not the candidate of black America, although I am black and proud. I am not the candidate of the women's movement of this country, although I am a woman, and I'm equally proud of that. I am not the candidate of any political bosses or fat cats or special interests. without endorsements from many big-name politicians or celebrities or any other kind of prop, I do not intend to offer to you the tired and glib cliches which for too long have been a separate part of our political life. I am the candidate of in the people of in America. You. That was sure. Chisholm in Chisholm in seven. That was Shirley Chisholm in 1972. Well, we're still here with Barbara Ransby, historian, author, and activist, professor of black studies, gender and women's studies, and history at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Barbara, your thoughts uh, about the, the legacy of, of Shirley Chisholm? Yeah, I think about Shirley Chisholm a lot uh, these days and that wonderful slogan of her campaign, unbought and unbossed, right? Uh, she was an independent thinker. She was fierce. She uh, came out of Brooklyn, as you said, and came from West Indian parents. And she had a tough a road, you know, just uh, in terms of representation, we were talking about before being the first black woman in Congress. There's a scene, uh, Shawa Lynch has a wonderful documentary film about Shirley Chisholm, and Shirley Chisholm recounts a uh, Southern white senator who just couldn't get over her sitting across from him and them having the same job. And he said, you know, Miss Chisholm, we both make 39.5, and she said, I'm going to keep on making 39.5, you know, so she, she forced her way into spaces that you know, she was not wanted because of racism and sexism. But inside the Democratic Party, when she ran in 1972, she got mocked. She got a lot of opposition, also from black leaders, uh, black male leaders in particular. Um, and she was uh, somebody, I think, who I, I never met her. But, um, you know, from my study of black women's history and from people who, who did know her, you know, she was a person of principle and resisting pragmatism that is so rampant in politics, right? So, you know, Black Panther Party supported her, and she supported them. And they were saying, well, why are you supporting this group of armed, you know, folks? And she said, well, because they're fighting for, you know, poor black people. So, um, so I think Shirley Chisholm really represents some of the best of folks working inside uh, electoral politics, and, and wish we had more of that. And what was the response to her running for president? And how much pressure to, did she receive? She, she received a lot of pressure to not run for president and uh, a lot of pushback from people who she felt, uh, who she thought initially would support her. Um, again, you know, her appearance was mocked. Her, 
uh, you know, she was she was sidelined in a lot of ways uh, in larger democratic and political and a black political discourse. So she had a lot of pushback being a woman and being black. And so talk about her campaign. And ultimately, obviously, she did not get the yeah. uh, nomination. But when she decided to pull out, uh, the pressure both in the overall community and also in the black community, the response yeah. to Shirley Chisholm running for president. Yeah. I think she was very close to Ron Dellums at that time. And so uh, she she went to the convention. Uh, she, the congressman from California. The congressman, late congressman from California, who was a very progressive force in Congress. It was a young activist at that time. And uh, she went to the convention and, you know, realized she didn't have enough delegates and wouldn't have enough delegates and released her delegates in very tearful fashion. But. Um, you know, but then continue to be a voice and to be a presence in Democratic Party circles, but not just in Democratic Party circles, this is 1972, in movement circles. And I think talked about the need for a link between social movements and electoral politics, which is really what we have to remember in this moment. Let's talk about Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, Shirley Chisholm uh, comes after Fannie Lou Hamer, yeah. um, the daughter of Mississippi sharecroppers who became involved in the civil rights movement when she volunteered to attempt to register to vote in 1962. By then, the 45-year-old mother lost her job, continuously risked her life over her civil rights activism. Despite this and a brutal beating, um, Hamer helped organize the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. We're going to go right now to a clip of Fannie Lou Hamer. This is 1964, addressing the Democratic National Convention, the Rules Committee, in Atlantic City, New Jersey. If the Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America. Is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to sleep with our telephones off of the hook because our lives be threatened daily because we want to live as decent human beings in America? So that's Fannie Lou Hamer. And Professor Ransby, we want you to tell us about what she was attempting to do and what the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party was, um, this alternate delegation. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the time, Lyndon Johnson was so outraged that the cameras were focused right. on this black woman uh, at the Democratic National Convention that I think he held an impromptu news conference Good to time just time. pull the cameras away. Mm -hmm. But talk about this woman's significance. Yeah. Well, when I saw her significance and the significance of the MFDP, Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which helped to organize uh, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party along with Ella Baker and others. When I saw the, the, the clip of the uncommitted delegation holding hands, coming in as outsiders inside, uh, coming into the convention hall, uh, asking for so such a basic recognition of their dignity. Uh, I thought of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic uh, Party delegation. Of course, black people uh, had been disenfranchised in Mississippi and much of the South since Reconstruction. Fannie Lou Hamer has a special place in my heart, not just as a historian, but she came from the same county in Mississippi, was born in the same year as my mother, uh, who also worked as a sharecropper and a domestic worker. Uh, so I think of Fannie Lou Hamer as very much of my mother's uh, generation, but also many common experiences. So Fannie Lou Hamer, you know, met young people organizing around voter registration, you know, in the 60s, and she, uh, they tell the story in SNCC of her looking down the road and you know they're coming in their coveralls with their you know clipboards trying to uh, register black voters and she said she had waited all her life to see them come up that road you know because she was her famous quote is sick and tired of being sick and tired and so Fannie Lou Hamer in some ways you know became the heart of SNCC and of course the heart of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party the thing I like to say about her too she's often discussed in this sort of folksy way 
Uh, she, she sang, she was a religious woman, very powerful voice, and told her story in a most compelling and powerful way, right? Which is why Lyndon Johnson didn't want people to hear that story. Uh, but, uh, but she also was an intellectual and a strategist. She was an internationalist. Uh, when MFDP and SNCC took a position against the war in Vietnam, she supported it. Uh, she traveled to Africa with young people in SNCC. Uh, so somebody who had an expansive notion of freedom. You might say somebody growing up, you know, one of you know, many children, I think is 11 or 13 children in her family. Uh, she would have a very small or parochial view of the world. You know, I want my freedom. But no, she said we have to get freedom for everybody. And so when the MFDP went to uh, Atlantic City in 64, they came with this delegation that had held an alternative uh, process of, of selecting electors because they were excluded from the Mississippi Democratic Party. Uh, and they said, look, we, we represent, we're a multiracial group, we represent the uh, the people of Mississippi, we want to be seated instead of this racist, segregationist, all-white delegation. And the Democratic Party leaned into pragmatism over principle and said no. And then there was all the behind the scenes, and as I understand it, uh, uh, Kamala's team offered uh, the uncommitted folks a, a compromise, which would be a, a private meeting, which was so insulting. And similarly, the MFDP had been offered two seats instead of seating their whole delegation. And Fannie Lou Hamer and others said, no, she, her line was, you know, we, we all, we've all come a long way and we're all tired and we're not taking no two, no two seats today.